We are born free. And we will die free. The time in between, though, that's complicated. In that time, governments, institutions, and our egos will limit our ability to find true freedom in this life. These are real stories of real people overcoming the odds, persevering in justice, and unlocking their potential. Welcome to Finding Freedom. Here's your host, John Oderman. Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of Finding Freedom here on the Lions of Liberty Podcast Network. And we are once again trying out the live streaming here on Thursdays. So if you are watching, great. Um, if you want to watch in the future, you can watch on YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, all of our channels. Um, also on Facebook, if people are still on Facebook, check it out there. Um, stream into all of our platforms. And uh, if you only have a chance to watch a, maybe a snippet of it today during the live stream, be sure to subscribe to our you know, podcast. Um, you can do that on any podcasting platform. Of course, you can do that either by subscribing to the Lions of Liberty Network or just to Finding Freedom with John Oder, Matt. You can find any of those or both of those on any podcast platform. And as always, I like to give a plug, of course, for our Lions of Liberty Pride, our patron group. You can join that on Patreon or on Locals. I'm not going to give the URLs because who actually types in a URL anymore? You can just search Lions of Liberty on those two places to find us. And uh, you'll get some bonus content and some other goodies. So without further delay, let's get to today's show. I have a really interesting guest today um, who has been making the rounds on the podcast network. You might have seen him recently with Tim Pool. Um, his name is Ryan Slate. He's the host of the Create Your Own Life podcast. And on that podcast, he studies some of the highest performers in the world. Um, he also talks a bit of politics, as we uh, talked about in the, uh, the pre-show chat here. We'll get to that, too. He studied at Oxford University as well as he holds a master's in early Roman Empire propaganda. Definitely going to talk about that. That's from Seton Hall University. Um, his podcast has a bunch of accolades. It was number one podcast to listen to by Inc. Magazine in 2019, as well as Top 40 Under 40 by Podcast Magazine in 2022. Um, him and his wife um, co-founded a uh, company called Command Your Brand. Uh, which focuses on helping entrepreneurs share their message by appearing as guests on podcasts. And uh, he resides in New Jersey, so I won't hold that against him. I'm in Pennsylvania, but nothing against New Jersey. Great state. Ryan, or Jeremy, I won't do that again. Jeremy, welcome to Finding Freedom. Hey, man. Thank you so much. I, I once had as regal a mustache, too, but my, my wife had me shave it for her birthday, and it's on its way back now. <laughs> there, there you go, man. Um, It takes... Uh, it takes some, I don't know what the word is. It takes some balls, I guess, to uh, to grow a mustache and, and wear it around in public. So I always have respect for people that are able to uh, to do that and pull it off. And I was actually going to shave mine three or four weeks ago. My wife and I were going out of town on a trip. And I said, I'm, I'm going to shave it. And she said, no, keep it just a little bit longer. So we'll see. I, I had a very like Wilfred Brimley one going on. So like to give my wife, my, to give me a hard time, my wife would always go diabetes. Um, so that, that was the eventual end of my very walrusy mustache. Well, that that's commitment there to have there. <laughs> did you curl it up on the sides too? No, I didn't bit? curl it up, but like it was enough that I got diabetes. That was, that was about it. <laughs> there you go. All right, man. Well, excited to, uh, have you on the show today. Talk about, um, all of the things, but, um, I think that, I mean, the first thing, I think a good place to start since you are an expert in podcasting, you have a pulse on the market, I think today, um, just learning about how you first became interested in podcasting and how you've launched your first foray into podcasting. It's interesting because it was so long ago. I, it's like, I feel like how I got started is no longer as relevant because that the world has changed so much, right? Like when how I got long started, ago was it? So this was 2014 and there were 250,000 podcasts out there. And there's like 3.5 million. Um, That's that the are out same year I started podcasting too. Is it really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting because this, the pool was just so much smaller. Um, and it, so I mm -hmm. think it, it was a little bit easier 
to get traffic in the beginning. But for me, I actually, um, I was a big fan. This is back since like 2010 of the no agenda show with Adam Curry, which I still listen to to this day. And that was the very first like podcast I got into. And they, they're, I think they're at like 1600 episodes or something like that. Now they, they've produced twice a week and it's the show that really got me into, into podcasting. And I became a, a super fan of podcasting from that. I, I listened to way too many shows and back in 2015, after failing at numerous different things, I had been a high school teacher. I was absolutely miserable. So I, I tried just about everything you could do to make money after quitting that job. Started a podcast simply as a hobby. And we had 10,000 listens in our first 30 days, which, you know, any anything you're new at, that, that's relatively unheard of. So we had a lot of success, mm -hmm. started climbing podcast charts. And interestingly enough, though, that the, the show has changed so much because, as you mentioned, you know, we used to talk to a lot of like high performers and people like that. But like to me, you know, once all the, the the BS of, you know, 2020 and 2021 happened, I was kind of like, you know, do I agree with what's happening? No. Am I going to be silent anymore? No. And I, I started really talking about more of the things that mattered to me that I've always talked to people about in private. You know, I grassroots campaign for Ron Paul in 2012. So like for me, this was stuff that was always important to me. And I felt like it was it was the time that I needed to, to take this platform I built and talk about something more important. So what kind of like evolution have you gone through in, in your podcasting? You said you started in 2014. Um, has it always been interview based shows? Have you done, you know, individual content where it's you, you know, just uh, just talking through topics or what's your what, what's your favorite format to do? So it's interesting because I feel like that's changed, too, as I've changed as a host. And my kind of first attempt at a podcast was called Rock Your Life. It was like a, a kind of a 30 day. Let's try and start a podcast thing. It was terrible. It was a, a content driven type podcast. And it was it was just bad because it was all about, you know, just trying to get people to follow me and be interested in what I was doing. It wasn't really valuable to anyone. Mm -hmm. I started the current podcast I had literally because I wanted to learn from people I found where I found really to be unreachable. So I tried to reach out to them, had a lot of success, and I wanted to learn what made them tick. So, mm -hmm. And that was just really getting into conversations. I'll be honest with you, though, John, like those early conversations, since I hadn't really interviewed somebody before, I didn't want to be on video because I was terrified of it. Um, I came up with way too many questions because I didn't want to like have dead air. I'm like, if I don't have 45 mm -hmm. questions pre-written for this interview, like it's not going to be good. So it, it was like, you know, in movies, when when you're in an interrogation, they shine that light in your face. Like, that's how I felt like for my poor guests from all my first interviews. You know, where were you on the date of December 6th? It was like kind of yeah. like like that. Like it was like question one, question two, question three, question four. So like I really am grateful to those early interviewees and their their grace and their their willingness mm -hmm. to to let me improve. And I, I will tell you, it took me about 500 interviews to feel like I, I was a, a halfway decent interviewer. and as the show has progressed, I'm, I'm actually finding now a lot of the feedback I'm getting from my YouTube audience is people actually like these 20 to 40 minute episodes I do on a, like a, a political historical topic where I just mm -hmm. sit and dissect something and look at something. I did one recently on the, the transition of, of Rome's Republic to the empire. We did one that was purely based on the year 1913 and all the strange things that happened in 1913, which, you know, may or may not have led to the the death of the republic so that's obviously we're still doing interviews we're still doing a lot of great interviews but i'm finding my audience is like please do these for us because we're really enjoying you know the education you're bringing us yeah we, we were talking a little bit pre-show and you and i i think um have very similar stories uh politically both in kind of how we evolved and then where we kind of are today, I think. I don't think we're in the exact same place, but, um, you know, you had mentioned, you know, that you were kind of brought into libertarianism because, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. so, so correct me here if I get something wrong, but similar to me, I, I was I was brought into libertarianism because, you know, I came to realize that, you know, blowing people up in foreign lands, it's not really a nice thing to do. And uh, I thought back to my childhood. Us, in, in, in addition to that, it costs us too much money as well. <laughs> <laughs> I thought back to my childhood, like for George H. H. W. Bush, for the very first Iraq wars, and uh, you know, seeing things blowing up on TV and thinking, "Oh, that's cool. We're we're bombing people." And then as I got older, I'm like, "Wait a minute, we're bombing people. There are people on the ground there that are getting bombed. And who are these people? And are they 
you know, the, the same as the government who's, you know, making these decisions that are causing the bombing. And uh, that made me question it. And that led me to the Federal Reserve, which led me into, you know, learning economic policy and learning the history of the Federal Reserve. And um, like you, became a Ron Paul supporter. Um, but then, you know, similar to you with COVID, um, I had a podcast prior to this where it was focused entirely on the criminal justice system. And I exclusively interviewed people who had been to prison, mostly for nonviolent drug crimes, uh, but who, who had been to prison and come out on the other side, sharing their story. Um, it's a lot of incredible stories. But when COVID happened, you know, I realized like this is happening right in front of my face. I have to talk about it. Like this stuff's important too, but I need to talk about the, these real events and how business owners and, um, you know, real people, <clears throat> you know, working through this are, are, are getting by. Um, and, you know, with libertarianism, oftentimes we're talking about theory and what if the government did, did this, what if the government did that? Well, the government did that. And, uh, you know, there was no response. There was no way for us to fight back. The Libertarian Party, what did they do? They, there's nothing they could do. They, they don't have any, uh, they don't have the political capital to do anything. So that kind of brought me back in, at least at the local level, to the Republican Party. And I'm a registered Republican again, although I'm still you know, friendly with, uh, with Libertarians. But what, I guess the question, my long rambling um, um, diatribe here, uh, my question for you is, what ultimately do you think brought you away from libertarianism back into the Republican Party? Well, I guess the the and I've I've talked to Austin Peterson. I don't know if you follow Austin Peterson. I've talked to yeah. him about this quite a bit as well. And it's, you know, I, I think part of it, like, and I don't want to insult any libertarians out there, but like, I think at the same time, there's this idea of we also don't want to win, which I think can be hard sometimes. Like, you, do you know what I mean? Like. To, mm -hmm. to win a national election, there are certain things you need to do. And the way the system is set up, it's it is kind of rigged and it isn't cool. Right. Like there, it needs to be a more open system. But to, to really win, you need to be one of the two parties is how it is. And I think to just say I'm going to have to pick something in the middle, like does put you in a bad situation because then you're letting one of those two parties win anyway. So it's like, why not at least throw your support towards one you think can win? And I think so I think that's one part of it. I think the other part of it is like. um. I think some of the, the views on drugs kind of kind of bug me a little bit because like I, I'm a dad. So it's like I do look I want my kids to be protected and stuff like that. Um, I, that's that's kind of the things that, that really got me is it's like, let, let's let try and win something. Let's just not. Do you know what I mean? Like you need, you need yeah. hands on enough, but hands off enough. Right. Like and I, I think totally hands off isn't good enough. It, it, it is is uh, like totally hands off is 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 too little control. But you do need some market controls and government controls and things like that too. Do you get what I'm saying? Like it's, it's, it's not a totally one way thing. I, I do get what you're saying. And I'm, I'm probably Is that not too circular. Totally that. That's, that, that's okay. But I mean, let's, let's zero in on the, the drugs thing for a minute. Um, because I, I think it's important. And I did reference my past history interviewing a lot of people who'd been to prison for drug crimes. A lot of them just, just crazy stuff like conspiracy crimes where, you know, someone can come in and say, you know, I, I saw this guy buy X amount of uh, cocaine and that evidence right there, it's called ghost dope, is enough to lock someone up for, um, you know, decades. It's it's yeah. crazy. The uh, the criminal justice. justice well, no, and I, we our criminal today. justice system, like it, it, it's rigged, man. Like it, it sets a I lot know. of people up in a way that it, it's just it, it isn't fair. You know, if you look at the number of people that, um, you know, just for, for nonviolent drug offenses that are in prison, it's, it, it is insane. And then once they're in there for those offenses, they're, they're, I, I had a guy that I knew from the gym I used to go to, um, had a problem when he was younger. He was a heroin dealer. He came out and he was totally clean and he wanted to do something with his life. Mm -hmm. No one would give him a job because he had that in his record. So I, I do think there is, there is definitely a problem with that. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And, uh, and, and, to zero in on like the, the libertarian part of this. So, and I, I agree with libertarians in, in on the theory side of it, right? So, you know, I, I don't want to throw someone in prison for doing drugs if they're, you know, just doing them at their house or hurting anyone. That's fine. Also, I don't want to throw anyone in prison if they're, you know, a sex worker and, uh, you know, they're making money that way. They're allowed to do that. But the problem is what I have with libertarians is when they start like using these things and promoting them as a way to live your life, 
and promoting sex work as some like glorified thing. Yeah, that that's is exactly the point and, I'm and making. Promoting, that's, promoting that's drug it, use. Yeah. Like you, I, I have a daughter. I, I mean, I can't be affiliated with a party that is promoting that stuff. I mean, it's just, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. No, that's, that's the exact, the exact point I was making. Like, like, to, to, and I don't want to say that it's, it's not an, un, it's an unmoral thing, but at the same time, like there's a certain morality to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and, and I, and I think like, there's a certain amount of that I want to have in, in the family I'm raising too. You know, like I'm, I have two daughters, like I'm, I am overprotective. I'll be honest with you, but mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're three and five. So they need dad. Um, and I, I just, to me, I would consider like what I want things like that happening to my daughters. hundred percent. And I mean, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I don't know how active you are on, on libertarian Twitter, but um, there was a recent, not that, not that active at all. I'm, I'm actually more in the, 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 the MAGA Twitter threads. If you want to go there, <laughs> well, that, that's probably very interesting too. We can talk about that as well. Um, and I, I do want to get your opinion on the, uh, uh, presidential race here in a, in a minute, but there was a disagreement between libertarians, which the, uh, you know, the hardcore, um, they would call themselves the most principled libertarians who, when they look at public property, would say everyone has a right to that public property. So they're looking at a, a public school saying that a, uh, a homeless crackhead has just as much right to walk into that public school and have lunch next to uh, you know a, a second grader at a table. And that's that's their argument, which is insane. And thankfully, you do have some that actually woke up a lot of libertarians who were like, wait a minute. We can't be saying this. This is insane. Who who would hold that kind of opinion? I mean, it's it's just crazy. Like the, the well, like like like, here, like here's even a thing. Like um, like morality. like like recently they were talking about RFK Jr. for you know would he be somebody that'd be a good fit for the Libertarian presidential nomination? And it's like, but he doesn't agree with anything you guys have to say for the most part. Like sure on 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 medical freedom, yeah, I can see that, but like yeah. he doesn't. Like just because he's a name, like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well, I think with RFK, it comes down to um, really the big three, which would be um, on COVID. He's very good. COVID also including um, you know medical freedom and you know not forced vaccination and not forced masking and all of that. The other piece would be um, Ukraine, which he's you know extremely good on, on that. Which wanting to stop funding. Um, funding Ukraine and the you know, Ukrainian-Russian war. And the third one, which I think is extremely important, which Trump has recently come out um, and talked about, which is a uh, central bank digital currency, a CBDC. And RFK is very good on that, which I think might be the most important thing um, that I want to hear a presidential candidate talking about. Um, not that all Americans understand it, so you're not going to hear them talking about it that much. But um, Trump recently, after Vivek dropped out and got in his ear, Trump did talk about the threat of a CBDC a little bit. And uh, I don't know if you saw the clip when he talked about it, but he was actually a little surprised <laughs> that the crowd of people he was talking to like even knew what it was. But uh, I, it, but, but you know what? Like, um, if if he knows General Mike Flynn well, which which he does, like General Mike Flynn's been talking about CD, uh, central bank digital currencies for four years, five years, he's been warning people about him. So, you know, it, it, I don't think that should be a shock to anyone. Yeah. No, um, it, it, it shouldn't be a shock to anyone who's like you and I, of course, you know, we're, yeah, we're watching this stuff. We're uh, consuming this content and uh, we, we have our pulse on it, but the everyday American, you hear CBDC and it's uh, ABC. What? what are you talking about? Um, but to get, to get back to Trump, to get back yeah. to the mega movement, obviously, Huge things happened this past week. He's now, you know, the presumptive nominee. He's clinched it. Nikki Haley dropped out. So but we she have won Trump. the swamp, man. She won the swamp that she wanted to. Yeah, that, I'm sure that really helped her. Helped her out a lot with uh, Trump supporters. I'm sure they <laughs> view her more favorably now. So you, you're, we're actually going to see this, which is crazy. If you asked me six months ago if I really thought it was going to be Trump and Biden again, I'd say it can't happen. But I mean, is this actually? going to happen? Are we going to see this rematch? No, you're going to see. And, and I'm, I'm going to go back on what Roger Stone's told me three times this year. Every And every time I question him, he goes, sends me right back to what he told me. Wait till July, which is the Democratic National Convention. And um, you are going to see Michelle Obama be the be the nominee. And I know they're going to people are going to say, oh, she came out this week and said she doesn't want it. 
Well, when they literally say that Joe can't serve, because once you get to the Democratic National Convention, they can name anyone if the if the presidential candidate steps down. So it it could definitely be her. And that's what that's what Roger Stone has been telling me for almost a year now. He said, expect her when you get to the DNC. That's what he's been saying. So I guess we'll see. And I I think this is going to be the greatest, greatest um, State of the Union speech you have ever seen in your entire life tonight. Because they are going to shoot him up with so many speedballs. He's going to be speaking in Latin. He's going to be giving us law codes. He's going to be telling us war stories. And they're going to be like, Joe's fine. He's great. Because this is the final performance they need from him just to get to the DNC. Yeah, I yeah, I wasn't going to watch. But I guess as you put it that way. Oh, dude, it, it dude, it's going to be a performance for the ages. They're going to put they're going to dope him up so much so that he performs. How long do you think he can go? 20 minutes? I mean, what's the max? Right stuff, two hours. <laughs> two hours. No, I, I think I think you get about 60 minutes out of him, but I think I think they're gonna have him so jacked up. And if you go back on some of his past speeches, you can see the ones I'm talking about where his pupils are like tiny and mm -hmm. he's like almost yelling the way he's delivering. It's they've got to have the guy of amphetamines on, on certain speeches in order to get him to deliver. Like the one he did um not long ago where he was referencing the president of Mexico as the president of Gaza. Like that was one they didn't have him hopped up on because you could tell he was stumbling all over the place. He kind of didn't know where he was. He couldn't remember where his son died. He couldn't remember um, where he got the rosary that he had his son from uh, for, uh, for his son from. That one was one he definitely wasn't all hopped up for. They probably have to use it sparingly. So they kind of save what yeah. what uh mental mental nuggets he's got left. But but tonight it's gonna be a barn burner, man. And that, that that's a good point because that was like an unplanned press conference. That was right after they came out and uh said that he was actually incompetent to stand trial. He what didn't have the you know mental ability to uh to stand trial. And I think it was his call. He's like, I I gotta go talk to I gotta talk to the press about this. And they probably either you know, it didn't fit in his schedule to shoot him up right then because he, you know, wouldn't sleep for a certain amount of time or it, he'd just been sh you know, shot up with a bunch of amph amphetamines too, too close to that. And it would have, uh, would have been harmful. So yeah, it's going to be interesting, man. Do, do you think that Trump and Biden will actually have a debate? There's enough speed in the world for that one. Um, you know, you know what I mean? If you, cause it's interesting because like, they're definitely not, neither of them are young men, right? Like neither of them are young men. But at the same time, Trump just continues to have the ability to just deliver. It's very interesting, you know, and I, I think it's a lot of the TV work and things like that. He's not as that experience definitely helps you. Um, I just I don't see an 81 year old Joe Biden being able to keep up with that anymore. I don't see it. Yeah, it is crazy with Trump because he's not that much younger than Biden. No, I think he's not. Four, four years younger, maybe, it's maybe three and a half. 70 something. Um, but you have to remember with Donald Trump, he's never drank alcohol in his entire life, which makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, he does have a terrible diet though. So I'm not sure how that plays in a diet, but, Coke, which that cannot be good for you. No, no. Um, and, and you know, normally, especially with men, you get to late seventies, early eighties, almost every man just hits a wall somewhere in that time frame. Joe Biden clearly has hit that wall. Trump looks like the wall isn't even in sight. So it'll be interesting to watch if that wall comes up on him, especially if he wins and becomes president. How are these four years going to go? Is he even going to make it through if he gets uh, if he gets reelected? It'll be uh, and, interesting to watch. And, you know, I, I guess the, the thing I would be concerned about, John, is like you look at his his hiring last time, right? His hiring was terrible, right? Like the people that 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 Trump brought into his uh cabinet were, were not very good mm -hmm. right like he kept there was a lot of turnover so I, to me that would be the thing i would hope he would do better on this time because that is how you get things done in washington is by having the right people so i i think i would i would hope he hires better this time around understanding the swamp a little bit better i i would hope so too i, I mean i think it's honestly going to be difficult for him to find enough people if that makes sense see that no, um, I could see that. I was talking to um, uh, one of the the January six lawyers yesterday. He said like it was the same di same difference with you know having people represent January six defendants. Nobody wanted to do it because mm -hmm. you're basically the wrong political cl uh, class at this point. 
Yeah, you're the wrong political class. And then there's, yeah, there's people who, you know, maybe they would, but they just don't want, don't want the headache. You know, maybe they're successful in business and why would they leave that to go, you know, serve in a, in any administration? Um, but I, I don't know. It, it'll be interesting to watch how it plays out. Um, before, I do want to talk about some more things with, you know, politics and culture, culture sure. here uh, towards the end. But first, I, I do want to come back to podcasting because there was something I wanted to ask you about. Sorry, I'm um, good at derailing a conversation. No, that's fine. Um, so I've had a couple of guests on recently, and we've been talking about the future of podcasting and how we see it playing out. Um, you talked about earlier with your own podcasting journey how it's harder to grow an audience now. There's a lot more competition, obviously. During COVID, everybody and their mother started a podcast. A lot of those people, a lot of those podcasts have you know stopped because Correct. people don't have the uh you know, they haven't pushed through, they haven't, they haven't, they haven't seen a return. So they haven't kept going. But when you look at podcasting, a lot of money has come into it. You have a lot of big brands coming into podcasting. So people like you and I, who, you know, we're just ourselves, you know, we're just our own brand trying to, you know, trying to build up an audience, trying to get our message out there. Um, do you think that, um, podcasting, you know, people like you and I who don't have a huge brand attached to us, unless we build up a huge brand ourselves, which not everyone can do. Do you see it shifting maybe in a more local way um, where instead of people targeting, you know, the whole United States, maybe targeting, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania, maybe just targeting Pittsburgh with the podcast or even more micro than that, maybe just targeting the South Hills of Pittsburgh with a, with a certain message. Well, I think that's been still being done through like that's being that is being done, but it's being done more through like, you know, advertising networks that can do like localized targeted targeted advertising like that. Mm -hmm. I think when the way you're seeing small brands win is actually through affiliate deals. And I on my show, we advertise a lot of my favorite products and those favorite products have really good affiliate commissions. So to me, I think we make really good money that way. And I think for, for other shows that have products you like, it's a, it's a really good way to make money. Um, I don't know as much about like building a local show because there is a, there is a lot to try and build an audience like that. But I do, mm -hmm. I do know networks are running, you know, more of a targeted campaign that you can run through different, uh, AI softwares on their network. But that, that, that's about what I know is going on there. Okay. Um, what other, what other advice would you have to uh, someone who, like myself, who's been podcasting for almost 10 years now, or someone just getting into the podcast game, someone looking to scale a podcast? I mean, you kind of talked a little earlier about, you know, you've had some success with shorter episodes. I know there's, like, if you if you talk to uh, John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneurs on Fire, he'll just say the shorter the episode, the better to make it as short as possible. Do you, do you have an opinion on, on things like that? And, you know, what can help you scale a podcast over time? Well, I, I will tell you, like, you know, I, I know you're talking about, hey, multi-streaming this on different platforms. I think right now that is one of the best opportunities out there. I think in video in 2024, you're insane. I think this is li literally one of the best video uh, opportunities out there is is to do be doing a video show. And mm -hmm. for me, my first I don't know, seven years doing this, I didn't do any video. It's only been the last couple that I've, that I've really done that. And that's when we've actually seen even more growth for a show that had been slowly growing, but we'd been stagnant for a bit. So I think if you're not doing video now, you know, you're crazy is one part of it. The other part about the the show length, and I, John, I've, I've toyed with like everything in terms of show length. Like, should it be 15 minutes? Should it be a half an hour? Should it be an hour? And what I found is if you can just do the topic justice that your audience wants covered, it really doesn't matter the period of time. Um, one of my favorite shows, um, still listen to this day, is called Hardcore History. And some of those episodes can be anywhere mm -hmm. from four to seven hours. Now, he only puts out one every three to six months. And sometimes those of us out in our audience yell at him, damn, we want one more often. But um, it, you have to do what actually serves the purpose of your audience. And I think to say like, this is the cookie cutter I have to fit in. That's not what podcasting is about. Podcasting is about creating something unique for your audience and something unique for what your audience needs and wants. And I think it is about, you know, doing things for, you know, a community membership. And it is about, you know, what extra things does my audience want? And to just really commit yourself to, okay, I can only do 15 minutes or a half an hour or every episode must be 45 minutes. It's, this isn't television. It's not like that. Like, this is what does my audience need to, to achieve their purpose? Yeah, it's really uh, uh what's the word? Um, 
not broadcasting, narrow casting. I forget who said that. Really, you can tailor, you know, your message down to the audience and, and what your audience wants. So, I mean, that that's something that that we try to do at, at Lions of Liberty. And um, honestly, you referenced, you know, streaming to multiple video platforms now. Um, when we started out, it was yeah, like we talked about, it was so much easier to grow an audience just because there wasn't a the competition there. But it's not only hard to grow an audience now; it's hard to maintain an audience. Yes. Because there is so much competition for time and there's so much distraction and there's people now who are going to click on this video and start watching it. And then they'll see a notification on their phone and then they'll be off of it. They'll go to the text message. They'll get an email or maybe they're watching this at work and their boss come over and say, what are you doing watching a podcast? Um, so it's, it's tough to, to battle with, uh, with all those distractions um, and be able to, to build up not only an audience, you, you don't want to just attract people um, just to watch the show. You, you want to attract people to your show who actually, you know, buy into it and, you know, agree with your message. You want to share your message with other people. So does that resonate with you? No, it's about building a relationship. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that's what it's about. Like if you're, you're fa so like one of my favorite, po I, I listen to way too many podcasts. So I'll reference another podcast to listen to is, uh, is talking Yanks. I'm a big Yankees fan and um, I could name their sponsors because I listen to that show so often. I know their backstories. I know about their spouses. I know about yeah. what they think about different years, Yankees teams. So like the more your audience can get to know you, the more of a reason they're going to be here for the content they're getting from you and why they wouldn't go to those other things. Like, sure, maybe they'll get distracted by their phone going off, but they're going to come back to you for what they can get from you specifically because, you know, maybe they care about what you're doing with your family or what community you're, you're in or, um, you know, what part of the country you're in or what's going on in your life. And I think that's the real difference is building community and, and really making your audience feel like they know you. Yeah. And that can't be faked. I mean, no, the, the authenticity of that comes through. And when you have, you know, a network like CNN, try to fake that and try to create their, you know, what a content streaming network, or I forget what it was that failed in like a week. Um, it, it just doesn't work. So what are your thoughts on cable news today and network news today? Those types of shows, do you think those are going to be phased out? Those are going to go away. They'll be repurposed in you know, more of a authentic type format? Well, I do think in a lot of ways, legacy media is dying, but I think the thing you have to consider is there's also a lot of money behind that. So that money, mm -hmm. that money has to go someplace, right? And and if you uh, believe a lot of the things I believe- Let, also let me pause of, you right there. We yeah. have uh, got a break for a commercial from Pfizer. So let me, uh, no, oh, okay. go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but there's also like, you know, um, if, you, if you believe a lot of the things I believe, there's also a lot of uh, three letter agency money behind them too. So um, there, there's a lot of backing of traditional media. Yeah. Now, I think their messages are being tuned out, right? Like you're seeing a lot of people don't want to listen to CNN anymore. A lot of people since Tucker left don't care about Fox anymore. And this alternative media of podcasting, of new media, like this is where people are going for their news. That's why people are on X so much and, and people are doing all these alternative things. So I think that trust in media is at an all-time low but there's still a lot of money behind it. So that money has got to go somewhere. And that money doesn't want to be spent on things that make you and I better educated, right? They want to make they want to make they want to be behind things that make you and I better educated consumers. That that's the real purpose in modern media. So I mm -hmm. think they're gonna find out their next strategy, but I think the way they used to do things um, doesn't have long for this world. Yeah. And, and they had so much control. I mean, and it was so easy for them to control us. And you have a background and maybe you can talk a little bit about this. You have your background in uh, a, a master's in early Roman Empire propaganda. Of course, in the Roman Empire, they didn't have televisions that weren't able to propagandize that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s in this country, it was so easy to propagandize people. And there weren't yes. as many TV channels, so there weren't as many distractions, there were no cell phones. You could get one message out on the radio, on television, it was so easy to get people online. Now mm -hmm. it's it's difficult for the elites to, to control us. I mean, I'm someone who believes that there are, you know, you can call them elites, you can call them the, you know, the moneyed influences that you actually dictate um, what happens in this world. I don't care how you, um, how you really, uh, d decide to what kind of name you put on it, but th there's a, 
there's definitely a shift. And there, there's, there's definitely a shift. A, there's definitely a power struggle going on right now. There's a shift, but I would say it's also a yes and no on like, um, you know, not still using that standard media to control people because there's this, there's a, a couple really good supercuts out there, but one of them is this one from Sinclair Broadcasting because what happens is there's these conglomerates that have bought up a lot of the smaller media companies, so there mm. aren't thousands of media companies. There's like less than ten actual media companies that own all the smaller ones, right? So there's this cut from Sinclair Media where they take. 25 different networks saying a danger to our democracy in the exact same format, tenor and tone and the exact same speech leading up to it. So it's they're all yeah. a lot of them are running the same scripts because they're being done by the same production companies and they're in the same ownership groups and stuff like that. So I think they're still trying to do it. They're still trying to get it out in different ways. And it's just it, it's still coming from the same ownership interest. I think that's what it is. It's 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 not as democratized as people would like to think it is just because it's, you know, ABC Seattle doesn't mean it's the same saying the same thing that that NBC Chicago is saying. It's probably owned mm -hmm. by the same company or a sister company, you know. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a fair point. And um, I had a guest on a couple of weeks ago, um, Anthony uh, Samaroff, and he wrote a book about really pharmaceutical companies and how they you know, are, are controlling the narrative in this, in this, uh, in this country. And he said something interesting and, you know, something that I've noticed for a long time, when you're watching any sort of uh, legacy media, every other commercial is a pharmaceutical ad. You got people, you know, dancing around happily and smiling. And then you have the those, jar dance the one, dude, I want to kill myself when I see that one. <laughs> And you have the 30 second thing at the end where it says that you're going to, you might die bleeding out of your uh, ass or something, but it's not like somebody's calling their doctor right after that saying, I need this pharmaceutical. Let's, you know, let's get this set up. No, nobody's doing that. The yeah. only reason it's, it's just about control. It's just about getting the dollars into the network. So they're able to dictate what they say and what their opinions are. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, It'll be interesting to see, like you talked about earlier, there's a lot of dollars in that, man. And as you know, our the way content is, is generated, the way content is consumed, as that changes, how do those dollars move? And you mentioned some three-letter agencies being involved in networks. I'm sure there's probably some probably some three-letter agencies involved in podcasting and influencing and, and all I, of those I would you want a good example of that? I'm sorry to, to break the hearts of some some Chiefs fans out there, but you look at what what happened with with Travis Kelsey being on every Pfizer commercial known to man in the last year, right? So it's like yeah. they go into the same market. It's just you know basically who's willing to take the money and who's not, right? Like they're trying to they they they'll move into the new medium and they'll just you know, it'll basically show you who's your friend and who's not. Exactly, if if you're willing to look for it, and that was just that was just blatantly obvious. I mean, you see this guy this in shape professional football player telling people to get a flu shot and a COVID shot at the same time. Yes. It's just absolutely crazy insane. But and then uh, he goes I'm, off I'm not, I'm not a fan script. of Travis Kelsey. I've talked about him quite a bit. I don't know how you feel about him, but um, like, I think he, I think he's definitely statistically one of the best tight ends of all time. Um, but I'm just tired of hearing about him and Taylor Swift this year. I really am. <laughs> I like his brother, Jason Kelsey. My um, wife's an Eagles fan, so I, I yeah. it's we 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 love us some Jason Kelsey. I'm not an Eagles fan; I'm a Steelers fan. But I I just liked. I mean, he's just a really authentic person. Um, he's probably a little bit crazy, but you got to be to be a football player. But in his in his press conference, he talked about you know the importance of being a father and raising his kids, and um, you rarely hear that from a professional athlete. He's he's extremely grounded, so. There, there's a really great documentary on on him on Prime. It's called Kelsey, um, yeah. and they just basically follow him around for like a year. It's a you you really end up really liking him by the end. Even if you if you already liked him, you're gonna like him more. I have to check that out. I did not know that existed. That's cool. All right, so let's we're just pivoting like all over the place. I mean, I, I, I love shows like this where there's I come in with a loose plan and then it just goes off the rails. That's when you know, that's when you know it's a good show. We've got a bunch of people watching live. Um, apparently, some people on Facebook too. So that's uh, that's interesting. A lot of people on YouTube. A lot of people on Twitter. Uh, people on Rumble. So thank you. If you can't watch this whole thing, or even if you can, please be sure to go subscribe to the Lions of Liberty podcast or. The Finding Freedom podcast, you can find the show in either place. Um, 
couple more questions here for Jeremy today. Um, Jeremy, when we look at the state of the United States right now, um, you know, I think we're similar ages. We can think of times that, you know, in the early 2000s when, when things were just more optimistic, like um, it wasn't all, all doom and gloom. Yeah. The economy was in was in decent shape. Of course, we were leading up to the housing bubble at that time. So it was, it was manipulated by the Federal Reserve. But uh, not to get caught up on that. We've seen good times in this country, I think. And right now, I mean, I think regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, I think it's difficult, at least politically, to be optimistic. You know, if you stay focused on what you can control, your family, your business, company you work for, whatever, you can be optimistic and, and, and you can kind of block everything out. And for most people, it's probably smart to do that. But the question I'm getting at here is, where do you see this going? I mean, do you think it's possible to have a turnaround? And maybe, I don't know if that's something that would come about from a Trump re-election or maybe years down the road after that, but is it possible to turn this ship around, especially looking at like what's been done to our currency? It's been so incredibly you know, devalued with all this money being pumped into the system. So I would definitely recommend your audience check out Rome's crisis of the third century. So Rome ended up falling in 476. But so we're talking about the third century. We're talking about the 200s. So basically almost another 200 years before Rome fell, they thought it was going to fall. And they had this problem of 15,000% inflation. Their money was worth nothing because Roman emperors had realized that if you can raise an army and you can pay them, you could become emperor. So that's mm. how generals would make themselves emperor. They'd raise an army, they'd pay their army more, they'd pay their army more, and they would start mixing metals with the money to make the money, you know, able to have more money to like pay people with it. So they debased the currency totally. Rome had gotten so big that they couldn't control it. So they needed multiple emperors, right? So they had four at one point. And um, they had these barbarian invasions all over the place, you know, not too, you know, undifferent of, you know, what's happening at our southern border right now. And in, in 284, the Roman emperor Diocletian did these very famous reforms where he helped to standardize currency again and bring faith back in currency. And he helped to do new standardizations with the Roman army which helped a lot of what was happening on the frontiers. And another big thing that that happened at that point as well is he took and he created a very standard for emperor management system, not, not very dissimilar to how the 10th Amendment is supposed to function, right? So we have a lot of the right things in place if we can get back to hard currency, if we can get back to, expect, to respecting the Constitution as written. But that mm -hmm. also means to looking, um, there, there's a few things that happened in 1913 that really shouldn't have. Um, you know, one being the Federal Reserve Act, which didn't you know go live until the next year. You have the income tax that passed that year. And you also have the uh, 17th Amendment, which took away the state's ability to, to select senators. And I think if you can get back to bringing this country back to making it a republic, it very much can be saved because I'll tell you right, right now, we're not at 15,000 percent inflation yet. You know, we're not at we're not at millions of people um, pouring in a year for for hundreds of years. We're not there yet. So there's a lot that can still be done, even though things don't look great. And, you know, it gave Rome another 200 years. You know, we haven't been around as long as, as that. But I think at the same time, like we could still give ourselves more time. I, I definitely could see it. Is this something that you think um, primarily is fixed politically or is it fixed by changing our culture? It's a cultural change is one part of it. And, and part of it is political, right? Because these some of these things are policy, right? Policy has to change. But I think at the same time, if we don't care for our families, if we don't worry about creating jobs ourselves, right? It's not the public sector or, or the uh, the uh, government's job to create. That's the, it's the private sector's job to create jobs. So I think when, when you look at it, unless we fix some of these things culturally, you know, we're, we're doomed to fail as well, you know? Yeah, um, it's 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 just hard for me to see really really how we get out of this uh, downward tailspin. But like, I am a very optimistic person, and I think as a parent, as a father, you have to be. Like, there's yeah. really no other choice than being optimistic. Like, we have to figure out a way to fix this. Um, and I, you know, I think I was a little different before you know, before my my daughter was born. And I was one of those libertarians who, you know, might've been like, all right, let's, 
um, let's just let this whole thing fall apart and then we'll pick up the pieces and we can start our, um, we can start our libertarian society then. Yeah. We can have our, have our paradise then or utopia, but that, that, that's not going to happen. I mean, if things do fall apart, it's highly likely that things will come back and be at least 10 times worse. Well, there, I think the thing we have to consider is there's no Gulch Gulch for us to run away to. You know, we have mm -hmm. to we have to preserve what we have, handle what we have and take responsibility for what we have. And I think to just think there's some place to go there, there isn't right. This is the place. And I think that's what we have really have to think about. Yeah. Well, maybe Argentina, you know, well, maybe, you know, we could hang out with Malay, right? Yeah. Could be worse. Um, well, Jeremy, thank Fuerte. you for coming on. The <laughs> what was that? A fuerte. What he says with his chainsaw every time. Oh, yeah. He's he's the best. He's the best. Don't agree with him on entirely and everything, but uh, awesome guy, entertaining guy, and love what he's doing in uh, Argentina. Argentina, Argentina, I can't speak. Anyway, probably about time to end the show. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for coming on. Why don't you give your your plugs for uh, my listeners out there who don't know about you or know where to find your uh, your content and everything you're working on? Absolutely. Well, I think conversations like this are vital because I, that is what makes me so hopeful for where we are in our history because never before has there been an independent media and in a, in a way for people to get their voices out. And that's why I wrote a really awesome book for people that are looking to get out there, create attention and use the power of podcasts to do that. So that's over at bestpodcastbook.com. If they want to check out anything about me um, or the company, that's going to be over at commandyourbrand.com. Fantastic. Jeremy Slate, thank you for coming on Finding Freedom. Hey, thank you so much for having me today, man. All right, guys. Well, that is a wrap today for Finding Freedom. Thank you for watching live. If you watched live um, or if you're watching this through the audio version when it rolls out on Mondays. Either way, be sure to subscribe to the Lions of Liberty Podcast Network on your favorite podcasting app or to the Finding Freedom podcast with John Odermatt. You can find either of those on your favorite listening device, probably the phone that is in your pocket right now. Really enjoyed this conversation today with Jeremy, and I would like to do more of them, more conversations in the future. And I'd like to attend, Brian and I would like to attend more events in the future. The way that we do that, the way that we keep bringing you this content is through your support. One way to support is by listening and sharing. Another way is by joining our Lions of Liberty Pride. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty or um, lionsofliberty.locals.com. I might've got that one wrong. You know how to search for Lions of Liberty on these platforms. You guys know how to use the internet, I think. <laughs> Hopefully you guys enjoyed the show as much as I did. I learned a lot today and I will see you all next week. In the meantime, always remember to keep your head up in the fires of liberty burning.